what we really want to do is be able to shape the, the advantages and the benefits of, of an advanced soil health market or a platform in terms of what that looks like. And that's a little bit of the journey I want to take you through this morning. But first and foremost, uh, there's our, those of you in the audience that don't know anything about Noble, uh, those of you that know us as the Noble Foundation, now all of a sudden there's this Noble Research Institute that pops up and what the hell is that all about, right? So just a real quick uh, uh, slide on the transition. Uh, the Noble Foundation, which was established in 1945, um, it was really based upon and developed uh, programs around those six elements that are noted there on the slide. Um, in December 2015, uh, Congress passed a piece of legislation that allowed the creation of another 501c3 entity, uh, which is called an Agricultural Research Organization, or ARO for short basically mimicked after medical research organizations. So what we want to do is we want to attract individuals of wealth who have an interest in investing in agricultural research to establish their own research organizations built up around those areas of, of research that are of interest to them. And so we had a decision to make in terms of our own development of becoming this ARO, and we did so uh, with the, the split out, if you will, from the Noble Foundation to create the Noble Research Institute. And we did this on May 1st of 2017. It took us a year and a half to really map out exactly what we wanted to try to accomplish. So Noble is still involved in the grant making and, and scholarship activities. Um, fortunately, I wear the, the hat as president for both those entities and I get a chance to make a grant to myself. So how easy is that? Uh, but Noble Research Institute, then all the employees, all of our land-based assets and everything are, are rolled up into that. And this also gave us the chance to really continue the, the mission of our founder, Lloyd Noble, who made this prophetic uh, statement that the land must continue to provide for food, shelter, and clothing long after the oil is gone. Lloyd was an oil man who understood growing up during the Dust Bowl days how precious land-based assets are. Um, he was lucky to strike oil, um, but he wanted to take his wealth and dedicate that back to the reparation of soil, but also education for farmers and ranchers in the Southwest. And what this did, it gave us a chance in becoming the, the Noble Research Institute to go back to our values of the things that Lloyd talked about in, in his writings and bring those things forward in terms of how we want to approach um, our activities going forward as the Noble Research Institute. So we have this vision of being this preeminent agricultural research organization. We hope there's many others that will continue to join in this effort and, and, and create one of their own. Um, but really, we want to be a source of transformational knowledge, products, education, technology to advance land stewardship, in essence. But to help us focus, we decided that we're just not going to do everything. And we really want to focus on those big ticket items that are big challenges in agriculture today. That's where we want to put our energies. And when, when we look back on our values in terms of building uh, through others, collaboration, never fearing challenges and so forth, this helps build upon our DNA of who we believe we are. And I want to continue to demonstrate to you all that we are a trusted partner going forward for all these different activities and, and love to have ongoing conversations with many of you. But let's go back now a little bit in time and talk about the soil health industry and the development of that. And first and foremost, um, I'm not going to talk about what's taken place before 2013, but let me say this. NACD, NRCS, SARE, many progressive farmers and ranchers out there who, who get it and, and who have gotten soil health and understood it for many years, they're the ones that have, have paved this way for others like ourselves to come in and renew our investment in that effort to really build upon a soil health platform. So prior to 2013, there was a lot of activity going on, and those are the true pioneers in terms of what was taking place. Uh, NRCS did a lot of the heavy lifting and defining and creating a definition for soil health uh, right under Jason and Wayne's leadership at NRCS and developing this Unlocking the Secrets of the Soil campaign. It really gave us the energy to continue to move forward. Uh, so in 2012, uh, the Farm Foundation, and Constance is here somewhere perhaps in the audience, I believe there she is right over here, um, and Noble got together and we, we started looking at what are those gaps in agriculture, what are those big challenges that we see, and, and through a lot of discussions it really boiled down to the fact that there are so many gaps in soil health research 
uh, we really don't know where to start, and we don't know where this is going to take us, but let's gather a, a group of people together to, from all across the industry to begin creating that, that roadmap, if you will, that research roadmap that helps us understand where those gaps exist. And what we undercovered was really 60 years of neglect, as I mentioned before. And, and so the, the question then became, well, what do we do with all this information, of which then became the development of the Soil um, Health Institute uh, in 2015. But let me take you through this diagram because this is really, I've tried to just simplify things as much as I could to, to kind of give you an indication of the momentum that's taking place in the soil health arena. So, and, and I say this is where we begin again, only because Noble was really took a, a break in soil health just like our land grants did and, and others um, in really re-energizing and rededicating them themselves to this particular effort. And so from 1945 to 2013, this is where Noble starts again. And so with the creation of the soil renaissance. Well, out of that effort and through, again, ongoing efforts of everybody else, you started seeing the development of other initiatives. You've got the corn growers, Monsanto TNC's effort around the soil health partnership. Kelly Elversall and Dr. Jan Leach created the Phytobiomes Initiative. Uh, in 2015, uh, the conservation districts established their Soil Health Champion Network. And by the way, uh, Nick, are you here also? I think you're on the maybe the agenda a little bit later on. I think the Soil Health Partnership, I'm sure the numbers aren't right, but they're, uh, a couple months ago, there were around 135 participants in the partnership. Nick indicated that there's a backlog of over 700 farmers who want to get involved in this. NACD, when they established the Soil Health Partnership, or the Soil of Champions, wanted a goal of 150 farmers across the country. There's, there are over 200 today, and that number is still growing. And, and Mr. Jimmy Emmons, who's here also from Oklahoma, is one of those Soil Health Champions. You'll get a chance to, to uh, listen to Jimmy's story. Um, but then the Soil Health Institute came on in 15. 16, California Healthy Soils Initiative, TNC, developed the Rethink the Soil uh, uh, concept, really reaching out to those absentee landowners to bring them into the fold and help educate them around soil health and what it means. Foundation for Food and Ag Research established a, a soil health group under the direction of uh, Lakeisha Odom. Lakeisha, I know you're here perhaps in the audience. There you are right there. Um, and then many commodity organizations started looking harder at this. And NCGA is not alone in that effort. Soybeans doing the same, potatoes are doing the same, rice is doing the same. So everybody's beginning to look at soil and, and, and starting to change that mindset. And then you've got the consumer-based uh, groups, and you'll hear from Jerry Lynch in a second. All of that group is now looking at soil and beginning their journey and, and looking at where there's their supply chains begin. And it, and it starts with healthy soils, and you'll hear about that. Uh, but then it's just not food companies, it's clothing companies like Wrangler that have really stepped up and, and, and really made an investment in this particular area. And then there's a lot of startups in the group today um, that have really recognized that soil health and the opportunities in soil health are going to have spinoffs in, in certain areas of technology that are going to be viable markets going forward. So it really is a, a really nice progression of an industry that's being built responsibly as we continue to, to go through this process. Uh, cover crops, just to touch on that for a second. We know we can't start a, a journey around soil health without putting more carbon in the ground, right? And, and cover crops is a precursor to helping us do that. Well, in recognizing that, uh, Rob Meyer, who's here also and has been directing the um, cover crop efforts on behalf of the cover crop uh, regional councils and so forth, um, and, and really driving a lot of the education, uh, we got together and we decided that let's get those groups together and let's bring in the supply chain components together and begin to challenge ourselves, are we really prepared for a, an, an increase in this particular market? And I just want to drop some figures on top of you so you can start thinking about the magnitude of this effort and what it can mean to change agriculture going forward. So we have roughly a billion acres of arable agricultural working lands in this country. Today, uh, CTIC and SARE always sponsor a, um, a survey, and right now they're reporting around 20 million acres of cover crop usage of those reporting. Theoretically, when you start thinking about the potential of cover crops and where this industry is going, we, we tried to land on a number of something that we could shoot for. And, and that number came in at around 100 to 150 million acres is something that we felt like we could grow to in a 10-year period of time. I'm going to demonstrate for you in a little bit where I think that potential is, is more likely like 300 million acres of cover crops and, and start just thinking about that magnitude. Uh, Jim Johnson, who's with Noble, did a, 
a, a quick uh, sketch on the back of a napkin one day and, and reflected on the fact that if we had 100 million acres of cereal rye that went on as base uh, cover crop on every acre that we're talking about, the state of Oklahoma would have to convert every winter wheat acre. So when you start thinking about that conversion, it, it really is mind-boggling in terms of the intended and unintended consequences associated with growing this market. So we want to do it responsibly. So Rob is, is, uh, is going to take on this effort uh, along with industry partners to really move this, this effort forward. And, um, and I think it's going to be an initiative that's really going to pay uh, spades for us. So when you sit back and you think about a fully developed um, uh, soil health industry, when this thing is, is built out and we've got all these great discoveries that are going on, you look at it and say, what are, what, what are those benefits to farmers and ranchers, society, science, environment? And you begin to, to really break out of those things in terms of what and where do you participate in that, in that realm? Where are the opportunities to, to be involved? And so I've highlighted in red some of those areas that, that we picked out at Noble to say, um, how do we begin to advancing our understanding and, and helping farmers commoditize soil and water to the benefit of the, of the farming and ranching communities? And so we started looking at these different things around market-based approaches, clean water, CO2 reduction, genome mapping and what's all that about and how are we using genome mapping and, and understanding the microbiome to advance um, our understanding of carbon and water. And so we began then to pull together groups in 16 and 17 that took a look at two different things. One is a, is a National Agricultural Water Quality Practice uh, um, Assessment being led by Sand County Farm Foundation, Noble, and NRCS to begin connecting dots around where are all the water quality projects around the country. And what are we learning from one another in this as opposed to working in isolation, which is what we're doing today. That's an ongoing element that will continue to inform the development of ecosystem markets. But then we, we started looking at the ecosystem market. And in 2017, we were asked by conservation organizations and environmental and agricultural groups to really come together and ask the question, why aren't we successful in moving agriculture into these areas of carbon sequestration? What can we do? There's been a lot of initiatives that have taken place over the last uh, two decades, if you will, going back to the Chicago Carbon Exchange, and nothing has been able to scale. And so with the Paris targets that were established, um, irrespective of where the U.S. stands on that, um, there is and there has been highlighted an opportunity for agriculture to take a, a much larger role in this. And so our discussions really were focused around that area of that let's learn from what took place in the past, all those mistakes and, and, and opportunities, but more importantly, let's drill down on those areas of why and, and what are those barriers moving forward. And I'm just highlighting two primary roadblocks that we had to go through. Um, and those were in the areas of additionality and permanence. As you know, the carbon registries established what those protocols are, and they kind of define that road of, of where previous efforts should have gone. Well, when you're working inside the farm gate like we are, and not working from the regulatory lever like other uh, initiatives have in the past, you begin to recognize that additionality and permanence are no-brainers when you think about it from a farming perspective. If I'm a farmer and I've been uh, practicing good quality soil health enhancement practices for 10 years and I've got my carbon uh, organic matter up in, in really good uh, shape, I can't participate in a carbon market. I, I'm not rewarded for my good behavior over the last 10 years. But if you're Wayne Honeycutt, who's just farmed his, his land to death with tobacco and everything else, <laughs> and his organic matters dip down a half percent, he can participate all day long. And we're neighbors. And he's, get, he's being rewarded. Well, that's not going to scale, right? We know that. So we are able to, to work with the registries to try to at least come to the to understanding that we, there's more reward associated with keeping carbon in the ground than releasing the carbon. There's more reward than taking people like Jimmy Emmons, who you're going to hear from in, in a second, and leaning on him to educate other producers around him about how they can build in, uh, soil health practices and participate in carbon and water markets. So additionality-wise, that's where we're moving. On the uh, permanent side, what farmer, working farmer, is going to tie their land up for 50 to 100 years in a conservation easement? and not recognize how they're going to transfer ownership of that land to the next generation. They're not going to do it. That's why they're not scalable. But farmers can look out 10 years, which is the length of a CRP contract. 
They can look, look out at 10 to 20 year time frames and say, I know how to manage my property to that point and I know how to create that generational transfer. That's just one effort. And they can manage their efforts and their, and their production system along those particular lines. So what we're doing with our ecosystem market and our partners, we're breaking glass. We, we're, we are throwing the conventional wisdom, not entirely out the window, because there are things that are built around science that we're going to have to prove as we move forward in this, in this uh, endeavor. And there's a lot of work involved in that. But those are the two major roadblocks that I think we're able to, to push aside. And then lastly, uh, we, we, we're staying true to our, our, our uh, point that our organizing principles are, are built around carbon and the benefits of carbon, which are water quality and water quantity, which gives us a baseline in order to build additional ecosystem services off of that. And also remaining, remaining farmer-facing and farmer-based in a free market approach. That's our, that's our premise. So our mission statement is this. We know that's a non-starter to get started with farmers if we go in and talk about global warming and carbon sequestration. But it is a starter when we talk about soil health, especially with the momentum that we have in the, in the industry that's moving right now today. So we want to advance ecosystem markets that incentivize farmers and ranchers to improve soil health systems benefiting society. There's not a farmer or a rancher out there that doesn't subscribe to this theory. Helping them understand that is a different story. And so that's, a, that's our challenge, that's our effort in order to, to put that out in front. But we do think, along this, the theory of change, that a voluntary market and a free market is much better than a regulated market. It's much better than government-funded type activities. Those aren't sustainable long-term. We don't want farmers farming the program. We want farmers farming with an ethic and we want to create a change of that mindset and that paradigm shift in terms of what they see. So when we look at these, these markets and recognize that agriculture plays such a vital role in mitigating a lot of the ecosystem uh, uh, detriments that we, that we experience every day, then it's irresponsible not to move forward with some effort that's going to at least try to accomplish these particular goals. So why ecosystem service markets? I touched on a few of those. The main thing is, is that there's a tremendous number of benefits uh, both to society and farmers in building resilient landscapes, and that's what we're all about. Um, one of the things that we did when we created um, you know, the, 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 the Soil Health Institute was to build a board around uh, areas of industry leaders that can really move the dial. We also built a staff like Wayne and Steve that could, and Sheldon and Byron that could really get the job done. We, we want 18 players in order to drive these things and recognize those operating principles are near and dear to everybody's heart in terms of success of moving things forward. So this is the steering committee composition that we have. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, myself and Chad Ellis with Noble, who's, and Chad's here, who's, and Chad is running all the inside the farm gate activities. Uh, Debbie Reed, who's uh, with CAG, um, and uh, also her own uh, uh, group called DRD Associates. Debbie is handling all the protocol development work for us. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Sean Penrith, who, used to, who was the CEO of the Climate Trust, broke out, started his own consultancy business, dedicating his time to this effort. Uh, and Sean is, is handling all of our financial and business planning activities. He understands conservation finance better than, than anybody. Uh, we certainly have Wayne with his expertise in the Soil Health Institute helping to inform on the science components of what we're going to need. We know our science needs to be bulletproof as we move forward. We, and he's there as that gatekeeper to make sure that, one, we're, we are gaining the funding to develop the science, recognizing some of it's going to lag, but also making sure that we stay within those ditches. Uh, Bruce uh, Knight, uh, Strategic Conservation Services, Services, former chief NRCS, is handling all of our policy requirements. Steve Rowe is the CEO of Nutrient, which represents the dairy cooperatives. Steve is here somewhere uh, in the audience. His responsibility is really bringing in that dairy um, uh, aspects of what they've been working on. They've been building around ecosystem markets and wants to join that force. We think that's a, a great move in, in order to continue that build out of different agricultural industries. Tim Palmer is an Iowa farmer and president-elect of NACD. We think the conservation districts still hold the key to getting more conservation on the ground than anybody out there. We just need all the conservation districts functioning 100% in 3,000 counties. That's the challenge that Earl Garber, who's on the Soil Health Institute board, knows that we're, we are always harping on, and, and Tim as well. 
So we really need that, that whole industry, that whole grouping to, to really come together. Uh, Jerry Lynch, you're going to be hearing from in a second, VP of Global Sustainability at General Mills. He brings in that buyer's club perspective in terms of how do you create a market between buyers and sellers. Uh, Gary Price and Jimmy, uh, two uh, farmers and ranchers uh, that are Leopold Conservation Award winners, uh, but then also they're, 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 they're the guys that, that understood this long, long ago. Again, you're going to hear about Jimmy's uh, journey here in a second. And then Alec Axel, who used to be uh, head of NIFWIF many years ago, but is still very active in different water markets, and he's in helping to inform us on the water. So I think we've got a collective group here that can really bring this thing together. In terms of, new pro and in terms of the structure itself, this is going to be a new organization. It's going to be a 501c3. We don't have a business plan for it yet. All of this is still in, in development. But there's a couple things I just want to bring out in here. I talked about finance and markets that Sean's responsible for. Wayne is handling all the science development with uh, NRI, Noble, as well as partners. Debbie and Bruce are handling protocol and policy. Noble on inside the farm gate. Uh, we're responsible for development of that, that seller side. So farmers and ranchers, what are those compelling offers that they need? But more importantly, it's going to take technology in order to drive that. We know that in order to build a cost-efficient trading platform, we need technology to drive this. So all of you folks in the, in the audience that are in the technology field, uh, we need uh, a, a technology platform that's going to be, um, allow us to, to conduct these transactions in a, in a very low-cost method. More importantly, and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about when I mention this word, blockchain technology. All I know is, is that everybody says we need a land ledger that's secure, where information can go in there and we can hold it, and it's verifiable, it's trustworthy, and it's something that will survive different generations of transfer, so we can ensure that that land is staying in holding that carbon and producing those ecosystem benefits that were there in the past. So I'm counting on a younger generation to help me uh, understand blockchain as we move forward. Uh, so that's kind of the, how we're approaching this in this four-prong approach and in, in, in ultimately developing this organization. This is my last slide. So um, we are in the process of developing a business plan. Um, we, we hope that it can be uh, completed at the end of uh, August. Uh, we are involved right now in the National Economic Assessment. Informa Economics has taken on this role for us. I'll just stop here and just mention, folks, is that if, if, if we can't see our way through from an economic perspective, in terms of, as Bruce calls it, the size of the prize and how we build out and understand e ecosystem markets, then we really don't have a market. I can't sit there and convince Jerry that I've got all of these farmers that are sitting here with all these, these great credits that have been built up when he can't find a way to accomplish his sustainability goals or his insetting goals that they have. And so it takes this buyer-seller relationship of coming together and understanding where those um, uh, alignment components really do exist, but also when you start thinking about the impact of what water holding capacity can do to minimize risk in f of flooding, but also minimize risk of crop failures and things of this nature, there's a whole risk assessment that's, that's built around that as well. So that brings in municipalities, utilities, reinsurance companies to be able to bring all of this together. So that economic assessment is extremely important. I don't know if we're going to have it done by September, but certainly by October we'll be able to inform enough around it uh, that we can begin to move forward. Uh, Debbie is working diligently uh, with Mark Kaiser of Kaiser & Associates. Mark is here with us as well. They're our chosen team to help build out the protocol. Chad Ellis and his group uh, within Noble have got a pilot project down in Texas and Oklahoma of, of roughly 50,000 acres and 14 different uh, uh, farm and ranch operations. We're going to take the protocol, we're going to inform the protocol around that particular pilot, we're going to perfect it, we'll go back to the drawing board, all in, in recognizing that the protocol also has to go out for public comment. But then we're going to take that as, as we get it perfected and start moving that out across the country and other pilots in other crop systems. And so we're already building up those relationships with different farmers and farm groups who are interested in involving themselves in the pilots across the country. All of that's to said that eventually in January 2022, that's our target date, we want to go live with a national market and be able to sell and scale those, those uh, ecosystem credits. It's a big job. It's a big challenge. I don't know if we're going to be successful. I may be standing up here next year telling you all that we had to scrap everything because the markets just aren't going to be able to support it. And if that happens, it's like it's not the end of the world. 
It's like, what are we going to do next? How are we going to continue to move soil health and get that in front of farmers and ranchers? And so those efforts aren't going to die out. It's just ecosystem markets and that development of that can ex accelerate soil health so much faster. And we begin to build this ethic. And when I talk about an ethic, and this is my last comment, I promise I'll sit down, Jimmy will tell you that it takes, it's a 10-year journey at least in order to build and optimize your soil health biological profile. And somewhere in that five to 10 year period, you cross through a veil. And when you do that, you're recognizing that your land is providing back for you. And you begin to think about the fact that you're now saving money because you're not putting as much inputs into the, into the ground, that the land is working for you. This is part of that permanence feature. When you start crossing through that, and, and I'll say also that the, the Buckner Farms in, in Missouri, we're going through that process too, we begin to understand what that really means. And there's no way that we're going to go back and farm the way that we farmed before. So that permanence gets fixed with a mindset and a culture that you can change things. And so if I come back here next year and, and, uh, and we're successful in, in moving these things through, I think that's great. We can continue to work together to, to propel that. If not, it's not the end of the world. We're all going to continue to do our work and, and continue to educate our farmers and ranchers. So with that, I'll uh, thank you all for your support and um, appreciate it. And I'll be around this morning if you all have any questions and then everybody else as well.